Great to see you all today. Um, we are on the sixth Sunday of Lent, and for those of you who have given anything up, uh, you're saying, yes! <laughs> Wait, almost done. Uh, and for you know, all of us, this, this is a, a holy time that we come into. Uh, uh, so during this, uh, these last six weeks, uh, we've been uh, having a lot of guest speakers come in. We've also been trying to keep to a sermon series called Love Actually. And the idea behind this sermon series, Love Actually, uh, is that we wanted to consider and wrestle with, practically speaking, what it means to live out God's greatest commandments. And when we hear the words of Jesus, we know this, that God's greatest commandments uh, are, are simply these. One, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And two, to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's not complicated. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand these words. Jesus offers a very succinct and simple answer to the question. Of course, the challenge is putting these commandments into practice. Sure, we know how to love and that we're supposed to love. But what does it really mean when we're supposed to love God? Sure, we know that we're supposed to love, but what does it look like in our relationship with our parents? Sure, we know that we're supposed to love, but what does it mean to love those who are lost and the least? And last week we considered, we know what it means to love, at least in our head, but what does it mean to love ourselves? What does it mean, practically speaking, to love? This week, uh, it is Palm Passion Sunday. It's Palm and Passion Sunday, because Palm Sunday is the day in the Christian calendar that we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, into the city. But we also call this Passion Sunday because it's the Sunday right before Jesus' betrayal, trial, and crucifixion. So passion, which means suffering. So on this day, what we'll do to finish up our Love Actually series is we're going to consider one of the more difficult applications of what it means to love. And we'll consider what it means to love our enemies. With that being said, let's pray and then go into our message here today. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you are one who speaks to us right where we are. So we pray that we would have openness to the way that you would speak, open up our ears, our minds, and our hearts. Help us to have the courage to hear and respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, there's a story of two brothers. Uh, they've been fighting for years. And at one point in their relationship, it got so bad that they stopped talking to each other all together. And even though their families uh, lived in the same town, they refused to see each other, and in fact had not seen each other for over 20 years. Well, as the two men got older in age, and as their health started to, to fade, their families started to put on the pressure. They wanted the two brothers to finally meet and to reconcile. Amazingly, the two brothers finally agreed. But they said they would only meet in the presence of a third party, a priest. And so they got the priest, and they got the two brothers together, and incredibly, the, the priest got the two brothers not only to talk, but in the course of their conversation together, he got them to shake hands. Incredible. Well, as they were about to leave, the priest asked one request. He asked each brother to make a wish for the sake of the other uh, in honor of the new year. And so the first brother turns to his second brother, and he says, I wish you what it is you wish for me. And the second brother then threw up his hands, and he says, Father, he's starting it up again! <laughs> I share this story because when we're talking about loving our enemies, I think it's important to recognize that our enemies are not only those who are living in a distant foreign land. When we talk about enemies, it's, it's good to recognize that those that we would consider our enemies are sometimes a lot closer to home. They might be folks that we see every day at school or at work, in our neighborhoods. They may even be at our homes. Uh, in fact, about uh, six months into my marriage, Sarah, my wife, she was uh, into our first trimester of pregnancy. She taught me a new Korean word. I, I, you know, I grew up mainly in the United States. I didn't know this word. But uh, this was a word that she would frequently call me when I would come home late from church. And it was the word wensu. And uh, translated, wensu means enemy. I was her wensu. <laughs> I would hear this every now and then. Sometimes we feel like we're sleeping in that with the enemy, right? Literally. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is uh, preaching and teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And he offers these words uh, that I'm going to invite us to read together. It's up on the screen. If you would read with me. You have heard that it is said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies 
and pray for those who persecute you. Here, Jesus is not again, uh, not only referring to political enemies, not only those who point guns and weapons at us. Again, here Jesus is referring to anyone or everyone who intends us harm, and also those against whom we intend ill will and harm. Jesus says, though you may not want to, though everyone else may think you're crazy, love your enemies. After all, what difference does it make if you love those who love you back? What good is it if you only show kindness to those who are already showing kindness to you? What impact does your faith have on you? And so Jesus says this, if we want to be his followers, we have to follow his example. And Jesus' example is this, he loved even those who considered him their, his, who considered him their enemies. And here's the, the key. If there's a, something that you leave with this morning, here's the, the key, the big idea for today that I hope you take away. We're commanded to love our enemies, not just because we should, not just because we ought to, not just because it's the right thing to do. I think Jesus commands us to do this because it is the way to life. Jesus commands us even to love our enemies and those who are most difficult to love because it is, it is the way to freedom. If we want to experience the life of love and joy that God created for us, we've got to learn how to love and pray even those who are the most difficult to love. Consider uh, our morning's gospel reading uh, a little earlier in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus has these words, verses 23 and 24. Again, if you would read with me. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And here's what Jesus is saying. God, our Heavenly Father, takes our relationships with one another really seriously. In fact, our relationships are so important to God. Why? Because our relationships with each other, they don't only affect those individual relationships. These relationships that affect us maybe negatively, they affect every other part of our lives. So consider this. If we come to worship God, and we come to worship, but our hearts are filled with anger, if we come to church and we come to worship, but our soul is weighed down by bitterness. If we come to worship God and our mind is replaying events of pain and hurt from the past over and over again. The reality is this, as much as we might want to, loving God and worshiping God is impossible. We don't have the capacity to hate. We don't have the capacity to hold tightly to grudges. And at the same time, love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? Amen. I want to show you an illustration of what this looks like when we hurt others and others hurt us. I'm going to invite a, a volunteer to come forward. I think I'm allowed. I mean, volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lance. I need a strong guy for this. Because here's, I think, the reality of what happens when we hurt each other. Lance. Say Lance and I are really good friends and I trust him. And I trust him and tell him all kinds of stuff like, who's the cutest girl at school? And he decides it's really funny. <laughs> and so he tells everyone else. When he shares this with everyone else and I'm really hurt, here's what it feels like. There's a stone that's put on his heart and a stone that's put in mine. And we start carrying this around. And of course it never ends there because now that he says something about me, I'm going to start saying something about him. So I'm going to give him another stone. And this is the biggest stone here. <laughs> And he's going to be carrying this around, and I'll choose a smaller stone here. <laughs> I'm weaker. <laughs> and we start carrying these around, and so I exchange back and forth. We're sending text mails and emails, and we're getting friends to sign with us, and all these little things add to more rocks, and more stones, and more rocks. <laughs> And we think that this is only going to impact us just in my relationship with this other person. And the reality is we end up carrying this bag everywhere we go. So I'm going to ask Lance if he would sit in the front of that on your lap. <laughs> and I'm going to try to preach this message with this on my arm. Um, it affects you. It affects all that you do. 
Again, you might think, you know, that hurt that happened, it only affects this one particular relationship, this one area of your life, only in this one context of your life. But the reality is, when you come home from work, when you come home from school, this burden that you carry, you can't let it go. It impacts you when you're trying to deal with your family. It impacts you when you're trying to be with friends. It impacts you even when you're trying to sleep. When you're trying to concentrate and do those other things. When you're trying to focus on those other areas of life. When you're trying to do those hobbies and activities that used to once fill your heart with joy. You find yourself weighed down. You might not know why, but here's the reason. Because you're carrying around something that's hurt. And you don't know how to let it go. Some of us, when hurts come our way, we think it's all right. I'm strong enough to handle this. I'll deal with it my way. Which means you don't deal with it. Some of us will say, this other person was totally at fault. He started it. So I'm not going to do anything to, to mend this relationship. And I'm just going to wait for him to hurt enough to, to finally do something. Some of us are so non-confrontational that even the thought of confrontations make us ache inside. So we're, again, not going to do anything. Here's the problem. The problem is life happens. And in the midst of life, you're going to experience joys in life. My arm hurts. <laughs> and in the midst of life, there's things that are happening because we live in a world where we're hurt. Sometimes intentionally. Sometimes unintentionally. Sometimes by the same people over and over again. Sometimes by folks and in ways that we never expect. If we don't know how to deal with anger and bitterness and hurt that comes our way, we're going to end up accumulating a lot of rocks. And we're going to start carrying these things around. And we're not going to know why we've changed as much as we did. Knowing all of this, Jesus offers these words. Again, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if you've come to the temple to worship God, and God who loves you so much brings someone in mind while you're worshiping, someone against whom you have this burden and this anger and this whatever, just kind of angst and bitterness. If God brings this person to your mind, here's what you're supposed to do. Even if it's in the context of worship, get up and go. Even if you have a great parking spot in church, get up and go. Even if you feel like, oh, I really don't want to handle this, get up and go and deal with this relationship as quickly as you can. Why? Because God doesn't want us carrying this stuff around everywhere we go. I want to turn to application. We're going to spend the rest of the time in application. I'm going to throw out two quick and easy ones, and I'm going to throw out a third one that's going to be a little longer. The first is this, application. <laughs> Jesus teaches us that the, when we're dealing with those that we might consider our enemies, those who would hurt us, we need to begin with prayer. Again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When you think of a person and all you can think of is bitterness and anger, when the only thoughts you have about a person are negative, when your only wishes for another human being is that they get hurt or have really negative things happen to them, the problem is not only with them, it's very, very much so with us. So pray for yourself. Ask God for help in this relationship. Ask God for your heart's healing. And then maybe you can start praying for the other person. When I was in seminary, I had the privilege that our seminary brought in a person who was a survivor of concentration camps during World War II. And she was sharing her story with a large group of us, and I heard and listened, it was so painful. And then I, I, in my class, we got to have lunch with her afterwards. And all I could do is, as, as I'm sitting there having lunch is I could just listen to her and I think about her life experiences. I wasn't sure of what to say, but finally at one point, right before lunch ended, I raised my hand and I asked her if forgiveness were an option. If forgiveness were an option. And she said this, it's taken me years even to consider forgiving God. And then she said, this is the first step that I have to take. And after all these decades, she said at this point, she and God were just having breakfast together. And that was a good start. That's a good start. When it comes to loving those who are the most difficult to love in life, we might not be able to do much. But we can all pray. Start with prayer. Number two, remember our sin. 
acknowledge that as much as we may be hurt by others, we're not totally innocent. We also hurt others. In the Gospels, Jesus puts it this way. He says, before you point out a speck in someone else's eye, take out that plank, that log, that bridge out of yours. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul writes, Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And Paul writes these words because he acknowledges, he recognizes that as much as we might complain about others hurting us, we do our share of hurting others. It's kind of like a human thing. I don't know what it is. You know, with part of our human condition, we have this gene that you might call, I'm going to irritate someone today. Gene, you know. We have this gene that says, I'm definitely going to rub you wrong at some point this week. We have this gene that we can't escape. So as we deal with each other, interact with each other, drive by each other, we're going to rub someone else the wrong way. So what do we have to do? Paul says, acknowledging this is the scope of who we are as people, bear with each other. Forgive one another. Okay? Practice bearing with each other. Forgiving with each other. Forgiving one another. Third, this is a little long. Practice saying six words. Um, there's two phrases that make up this six word list. Two three word phrases. I want to give you a hint on what they are. Okay? Here's the first one. A uh, hint for the first one. Several years ago, there was a research study done on married couples. And they found that these first three words they were used twice as often by married couples whose marriage lasted than couples whose marriages ended in divorce. Okay, can you guess what those words are? Don't say it just yet. Another hint. In the year 2002, the University of Michigan, uh, their healthcare system instructed their physicians to say these three words to their patients. The result of their physicians saying these three words to their patient was this. Between 2002 and 2005, there was a 50% decline in potential lawsuits. They used to average 262 letters of intent to sue every year. In the course of three years, it went down to 130 letters per year. Why? Three words. Can you guess what they are? You wouldn't say that to your patient. Come on. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor if you would. And repeat after me. I am sorry. Now, turn to somebody, look them in the eye, even if, you know, you haven't done anything against them, you probably have. Look, <laughs> look at them and say, I am sorry. I am sorry. Now, some of you are struggling to even say this, come on, we're at church. There's a, this really classic TV show, it's called Happy Days, and I remember one episode uh, where the Fonz, Fonz was the coolest guy out there, he was the guy every guy wanted to be like, he was the girl, the guy mistake. And he made a mistake and it was really obvious and so he had to apologize and so he starts to apologize and so he says, I am su, su. I am su, su. <laughs> He couldn't say it. Sometimes it's hard to say I'm sorry. In my home, um, it, it's been a, a little crazy the last two weeks. My wife Sarah has been suffering from an ear infection. We didn't know adults could get ear infections. <laughs> We're not supposed to, are we? Anyway, she has an ear infection, and it's been pretty painful, and it's knocked her out, and we've been going to doctors, and trying to do different uh, treatments, and she's been on drugs, and so, you know, she's been cranky and moody, and crankier and moodier than other times, and I can say this when she's not here. <laughs> but I've been cranky and moody too, so one day this week, Again, she's, she's on these uh, antibiotics and all this different stuff and really uncomfortable. I come home late from church. She jokes, uh, you know, she throws out this kind of intimate joke that we have that I am her Winsu. And I don't know what it is. You know, usually we just play with this, but, you know, I, I lost it. I got really angry. Long story short, we end up fighting over this because just, we end up having this really terrible fight. I knew that she was sick and I knew that I was a jerk, but a lot, like a, a lot of guys, I have the spiritual gift of pouting. And so I pout. And so, here on one hand, you know, I want to pause and just stay angry. On the other hand, I'm preparing a message on loving your enemy. Oh. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit is just plaguing my heart, and we're having this conversation. 
Finally, the next morning, I did the really, really mature thing and pretended nothing happened. <laughs> I can barely see it, cause just, I can barely see it. When you're the one at fault, it's not always easy to say I'm sorry. But consider, consider what happens when you're able to say I'm sorry to somebody. Lance, if you would come forward, please. When Lance and I decide that we can finally get over this, here's what's gonna happen. Yeah, my arm hurts too. <laughs> the rocks up on the cross. Another one. That's good. That's enough. And from my end, I take a couple out too. <laughs> I want some big ones out of here. <laughs> <laughs> some of these come out. Oh, I only have one more. <laughs> you can have your stuff, your seat again. No, no, you're gonna hold on to it. Because <laughs> we're not done. Right? Just because you say sorry, you're not done. There's still a word, a, a burden that you carry. You might say I'm sorry, but I'd say that's half done. The second of the six words I'd like you to consider is this. I forgive you. Repeat after me. I forgive you. One more time, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> and with meaning, I forgive you. Anyone want, if you follow Bill Buckner, he was a really good baseball player. He used to be an all-star first baseman. And all we remember of Bill Buckner is that in 1986, in Game 6 of the World Series, Bill Buckner, as a first baseman, he let a ball dribble through his legs, and he ended up losing the game for the, the Red Sox, and they ended up losing the World Series. And for the rest of his life and for the rest of his career, he was vilified. He was the enemy of the, the city of Boston. I don't know if you know this. 22 years later, in the year 2008, in April, the Boston Red Sox invited Bill Buckner back to throw out the first pitch. And if you saw this moment and you knew kind of the context of what was happening, and you saw what was going on in Bill Buckner's face, it was literally like, literally like this, because when he came out to throw that first pitch, this, the stadium, they gave him a standing ovation. Real long one. And you can tell, 22 years of just guilt, it started coming off on his face and he was crying. Because it looks like, Lance, if you would take out your final stones. It looks like this. And not only we can say, I'm sorry, but we experience someone saying to us, I forgive you. I want to close with just a, a couple of thoughts. The first thought is this, we can't force someone else to forgive us or receive our apology. Can't do it. What you can do, again, what does Jesus say to do? You pray, and you wait. If God's been working in your heart, and God's leading you to forgive, or say, I'm sorry, then you do it, and you extend it, but then otherwise you wait, and you pray for God to work in the other person's heart. Second thing, Forgiving is not forgetting. Now I know that scripturally it says that when God forgives us, God puts our sin as far as the east is from the west, which means that it seems like just it's all gone. But for us as human beings, we don't have minds that are like computer, you know, things where we can drag this memory into a recycle bin and just have it gone forever. We still remember. That being said, if forgiving is not forgetting, then what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is making room for God to come into the places of our lives that were once dead. Forgiveness is letting God go into those areas that are just filled with bitterness and anger. And if you ever have, a, have ever been gardening in the spring, and you have to break through fallow ground in order for there to be new life again, you allow God and invite God to break that ground and bring new life again. Forgiveness is opening ourselves to experiencing a life of freedom and love. The last word I'll say is this. Some of you are here right now and everything I said in the course of this message, it makes no sense. Because you're saying to yourself, Caleb, you have no idea what I've been through in my life. 
You have no idea how much pain I have been enduring. And I know there's some of you out here. Here's the good news, and I'll end with this. One message from one preacher is not going to do much. But while we are unable, God is able. Amen? While we are unable, God is able. And when we say, Lord, I want to trust you with every area of my life, including this area, while we're unable to remove those stones, God is able. And God will do God's work. Let's pray. If God is bringing someone into your mind right now, I invite you to lift their name up. Say to the Lord, I need help. With this man, this woman, this brother, this sister, this friend, I need help. Lord, would you give me the strength to forgive? Lord, would you allow me to experience freedom in my life so I'm not carrying around these burdens like extra baggage all the time? Lord, would you offer us freedom? We thank you, Lord, that you are the one who invites us to life. And Lord, you've died on the cross to free us. So Lord, we pray that you would move among us, that you would cajole us, that you would challenge us, that you would help us to hear your invitation, not simply to live, but to live well. Not simply to live as people who are walking around with so many burdens, and it's thinking it's okay to do that, but Lord, that you would help us to experience a life of freedom that you desire for your children. Bless us. Help us to respond to your word. Help us to experience a life of freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a time in our service where we invite everyone.